I'll go back to a piece of advice that Baker gave to President-elect Reagan in 1981. He said, you know, Mr. President, you have three priorities, economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic recovery. So now it's a combination of pandemic and economic recovery. Frankly, you know, what happens to the presidency in the United States over the next year, 18 months, has got to focus on that issue. Welcome to Straight Talk a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Bob Zellick. Bob has had a long and distinguished career in public service. He has served as president of the World Bank, U.S. Trade Representative, and Deputy Secretary of State. Earlier in his career, he has also served as counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury, and Under Secretary of State, as well as White House Deputy Chief of Staff. Today, Bob is Senior Counselor at Brunswick Geopolitical and a Senior Fellow at the Belfer Center at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He's the author of a new book, America and the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. Bob, welcome to the podcast. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Now let's start at the beginning. Like me, you're a Midwesterner, having grown up in Naperville, Illinois. What did you learn from your Midwestern childhood? How and when did you get interested in foreign and economic policy? Well, Hank, you might find this odd, but I still consider myself a Midwesterner. Uh, my, my, my family- uh, in the East, right. <laughs> My family was all from Chicagoland since the late 1800s, either in the city or outside. And my father had served in both World War II and Korea. So we had a lot of surplus military items around when I was growing up in the 50s. And I suppose that provoked my interest in military history, then more general history. And you know, for me, history was kind of a window on, on the world. My parents hadn't been college graduates. So uh, I started early on trying to figure out how I was going to earn my way to college. So I started Caddy, and at age 12, I worked in the library and uh, evenings after high school, worked in warehouse, U.S. Postal Service, which, by the way, was a very good job. And then the, the way, the latter out for me was to go east to school. And people might find this odd, but at that time, actually, my parents didn't want me to go to Ivy League schools. It just, it seemed outside my social milieu, and it was very, very costly. So at that time, I found a place called Swarthmore, which was co-educational, which seemed more normal for me going to public high schools. The cost was a little bit less. And I was a serious cross-country runner, but not serious enough for big universities. So Division Three worked out pretty well for me. And uh, I always sort of loved the history. And on top of it, I started to take economics and political science and international relations. And then later when I went to Harvard, I did added law degree, public policy, learned the difference between finance and economics. And so I guess I, my, the background was kind of multilateral problem solving based on history. Well, I tell you, I'm a big believer having hired, you know, college graduates, university graduates from around the world. I'm a big believer in, you know, liberal arts education from U.S. colleges and universities where you have a multi-dimensional education. But then you turn that, you know, you, you've become a thought leader in both economic and foreign policy, having worked at the Treasury Department, the State Department, the White House, the World Bank, as a U.S. trade representative. Give us an overview about how your career unfolded. And we'll talk a little bit about Jim Baker in a minute, but any other mentors along the way before you met Jim? Yeah, somehow early on, Hank, I developed this idea that in addition to the studies, I wanted to try to work from people that I could learn from. And I was fortunate there were a number of them. Uh, one of my law professors named Phil Hyman was head of the criminal division in the Justice Department during the Carter years. I went down as one of his special assistants and stayed an extra three or four months for a reorganization. I worked for Joe Califano, who was a great assistant for LBJ, and then later was a cabinet secretary. I worked for him in law practice. Pat Wald, who was someone I met at the Justice Department, later was on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. I clerked for her. And then a fellow named Dick Darman, who sat enough passed away. I met him through the Kennedy School, and he had been a protege and key assistant for Elliot Richardson in a number of posts, and then later became my link with Baker. 
I had wanted to go abroad. And when I was growing up in Illinois, uh, I hadn't even traveled on an airplane. So going to Europe seemed what wealthy people did. So ironically, my first chance was a fellowship. So I lived in Hong Kong with my new wife, Sherry, in 1980 as my first time abroad. And when I came back, one of the clients for Califano was a man named David Maxwell. He'd just come in as chairman and CEO of Fannie Mae. I wanted to learn something about finance, but I was in the Washington area. And interestingly enough, the mortgage market, as you know, was actually an interesting place to learn because given the oddity of the mortgage as an instrument, the whole process of securitizing, stripping them, all that started first in the mortgage area. And then through that, when Baker and Darman went over to the Treasury from the White House in 85, Darman brought me over and I actually started working on domestic financial issues. So I dealt with the restructuring of the farm credit system, SNL issues, the banking system. And then in 1986, Darman was going to be moving on. And so they moved me up to work as executive secretary for Baker at the Treasury Department. I had some other titles as well. With great inflation, it was kind of a what eventually became kind of a chief of staff role. All the paper went through me, but mm -hmm. I was simply working as, a, as an insider. And then I hadn't been involved in politics, but in, uh, in 1988, Bob Teeter, even more than Baker, kind of brought me over to the campaign for President Bush 41 about three weeks before Baker came over. I knew Baker was going to come over. And I was asked to supervise all the policy uh, work, domestic, economic, international, and the speechwriters. And so that was a wonderful exposure to the world of politics in an intense sort of four or five month period. We started 18 points down, ended up five points ahead. So that was a good way to work. And then after that, I was actually, I was offered you know, this, I was only in my 30s at this point, mid-30s, kind of assistant to the president for economic and domestic policy. But it gives you a sense is that I chose instead to go work for Baker when he became secretary of state. And my job there was to be, uh, it was titled counselor, it was an undersecretary level job. But rather than have big parts of the bureaucracy uh, report to me, I had supervision over the exec sec, so that was the paper flow, and policy planning. So I had the here and now and the future. <laughs> And my colleague and I, Dennis Ross, who is head of policy planning, either one or the other of us or both of us would be with Baker uh, all the time. And so with all those tumultuous years at the sort of the end of the Cold War, we were fortunate to be in sort of key advisory roles. And given Baker's style, what I just kind of imbibed was the need to combine sort of policy with process and institutions and Congress and communications. And Dennis and I helped with a lot of the strategic framing of those issues. So I was fortunate. I was the lead person for the U.S. and German unification. These are the issues of eventually the breakup of the Soviet Union and freeing Eastern Europe, U.S.-EU ties, NAFTA, the Uruguay Round, the creation of APEC, even global climate change. Baker recused himself. So I was the lead official for the only climate change treaty that's actually been ratified by the Senate. And along the way, as often happens, you kind of accumulate more of a role. I also became undersecretary for economics. So I, I don't think anybody knows this, but I was the only person in State Department history to hold two undersecretaryships at once, which made it more, more, more efficient. <laughs> and then all good stories have to come to an end. So President Bush was in political trouble in 1992. And so Baker went back as chief of staff in August, and I went back as deputy chief of staff. And had a very difficult few months in his unsuccessful re-election campaign. Bob, that's an amazing story, and it illustrates a point that I make all the time to young people. You know, it, it's great for someone saying, oh, I'd like to be and, and throw out some lofty position. But the way you get there is starting at the beginning, often at the bottom, working, learning one thing, you can afford to do almost anything other than not to learn, learning and growing. And you know that's how you put together a career. Now, few people are gonna ever put together a career like you have, but it's really how many careers are put together if they're successful. Oh, Hank, just to follow up on that, you know, it, I'm often asked by younger people, you know, okay, what advice would you give? And they find this humorous, but there's some truth to it. And I said, pick your boss. And I said, you think your boss picks you, which is, of course, partly true. <laughs> but I said, you don't have to like everything about your boss. The question is the bosses you can learn from. And if you think about what I was talking about with Hyman or Califano or Wald or Baker, Darman, 
you know, each of them, you kind of, you pick up something of successful people and how they operate. And as to your point, one of the things I also stress somehow for some reason early on, I picked this up, which is that put yourself in your boss's shoes. So don't think what you want, think what they want and what would help them be successful, right? And then interestingly, you know, if you start to think of things from your boss's perspective, you're more likely to become, become the boss. So, you know, I think that there is something about that idea about uh, it's a part working your way up, but it's also partly how you can learn and help that person be successful. It's interesting because I have given the very same advice and I learned it early on because my first job was at the Pentagon at a staff level where I worked with a whole variety of senior people. And I found that I learned from some much more than from others. And some appreciated my strengths more than others. And so when I had the opportunity to go to the White House, I interviewed six or seven assistant directors of the domestic council. And I picked the boss that the area where I'd be working looked less exciting, but I picked it because of the person I'd be working for. And it made all the difference, all the difference in the world. Your second piece of advice I found when I was starting out in investment banking. And the way to get business was rather than going to the client and trying to sell was to put yourself in the client's shoes and saying, what would I do? What would I want to hear? And that's true so often. Now I want, before we leave, you work so closely with Jim, you know, he thinks the world of you, you think the world of him. He was your mentor. Give an anecdote or something about how you got to know Jim and some story about what you learned from him. I know you learned a lot. We could talk about it all day, but leave us with something here. Well, I guess one of the most basic points was, as you know, you've also worked for impressive people along the way, but early on, I recognized that Baker was comfortable with himself. And so therefore he didn't mind if you could add different things, if you brought different capacities. And he was the sort of person that you know, frankly, if you stayed up till 2 a.m. doing talking points for the next meeting, he'd read them, he'd use them, and he'd make them better. And when your boss uses your work, well, then it's, you know, it's an incentive for you to make sure that you're putting everything possible into it. And I guess the other thing is we had a good team around us. I've reflected on this as I've watched other administrations. You know, we weren't always at each other's throats. We understood complementary roles. There was a sort of good sense of humor about it. And I've actually noted I mentioned how Dennis Ross was brought in. Baker hadn't even known Dennis during the campaign, but I saw this as a guy that could be very helpful to us. So my general view was if you're confident in your own role and your boss makes you confident, you bring in other good people. And, you know, how, how can you draw from one another? And then my book, as you know, has some good negotiating stories. Baker is a negotiator, has other tales, but you got to read the book for that. Yeah, yeah. And we'll get to that in a bit. I want to now go to your job as a U.S. trade rep under George W. Bush. Today, we're living in a very different environment for global trade than we did in the 2000s. It never has been easy, but it's, it, it's boy, in the U.S., things have changed. What has changed, and how should U.S. trade policy change as a result? But first, briefly tell our listeners what the job of USTR is. It's a great job and it's very poorly understood. So start out with the recollection that the office of the trade representative is very small. It's only, you know, when I was there, 200 people, maybe now 250. It's entrepreneurial, uh, got a tiny budget. My time is like $40 million. And it's primarily there as a coordinator and negotiating role. And you have to understand the context. The context is that the constitution gives the authority for trade with the Congress. And so, you know, until 1934, Congress used to set all these tariffs in these huge bills. And then in 1934, there was something called the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act, which allowed the executive branch to start to negotiate agreements. But this was done by the State Department. And of course, politics intrudes on trade. And so in the 60s, the Congress insisted that the trade job get put in the executive office of the president. It was first called Special Trade Representative then in the 70s, it was made USTR. So that gives you a clue. Congress thinks it has some ownership over the office. It wanted it in a political place. And the reason why the job is particularly interesting is you're really at the intersection of sort of basic economics, economic geography of the country. So I know where all sorts of goods are produced in every state and constituency because those were ultimately the votes. 
you need to obviously know how trade laws work. You need to have relations with Congress. But for many countries around the world, trade is their most important foreign policy. And so you have to have a sense of diplomacy. And ultimately, you know, I always saw the job as a problem solving job. You're trying to put together coalitions and in, in doing deals. So when I came into the job in 2001, the U.S. had had a series of these what they're called multilateral global trade rounds in what was the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs of Trade, created in 1947. But as you added more and more members, and by this time there was like 160 set of economies, those trade rounds got harder and harder to do because you'd have to get everybody to agree with everything. So when I came in 2001, the last effort for a trade round had failed in Seattle. We had to launch that. We had to get the negotiating authority, what now is called the Trade Promotion Authority with Congress. But I also launched a series of free trade agreements and regional agreements because, frankly, I wasn't sure that the global rounds, which last seven or eight years, could maintain momentum. And the free trade agreements allowed me to really create a little competition. If somebody were sluggish at the global level, well, we'll go ahead with the free trade agreements. Also, the free trade agreements, you could do more in them. You could have higher standards. You could bring in not only cutting tariffs for goods, but rules for areas like services or intellectual property or anti-corruption. And we actually also started to add the environmental labor standards. And so actually, if you go back today, the you know, has free trade agreements with 20 countries. 17 of those came out of my tenure. <laughs> and and, and uh, the other ones were NAFTA, so it's Canada, Mexico, and then one with Israel. And then what you then started to see happen was also part of the plan, which is if you could get more countries to accept the basic framework of rules, could you put together a regional agreement? So the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which some people may recall uh, was done at the end of Obama, but was abandoned by President Trump, that was with 11 other economies. Six of them were already had free trade agreements with. You could have never put that together, except everybody was kind of working off the sort of the common framework. And frankly, if you want to look ahead, you know, today we have free trade agreements throughout the Western Hemisphere, Canada, Mexico, five countries of Central America, Panama, Colombia, Peru, Chile, Dominican Republic. Someday, somebody might be able to put those together. And if Brazil decides to liberalize, you could create something of a Western Hemispheric nature. But also, you know, part of this goes back to the fact that you're living in a world of politics. In my view was success breeds success. So if you get these FTAs done, you build support, you get, you know, Congress to feel it's part of something, you get interest groups to sort of be involved. It requires a little aggression. I mean, you, you have to push because in my view on trade policy, you're either on offense trying to open markets or frankly, you're on defense raising protectionist barriers as we've seen over the past four years. Now, you ask where we are today. You know, the important thing is, separate from government policy, the trading system is always changing. So we've seen increased shifts to the services sector, of course, now the digital sector. You've seen changes in supply chains where the labor arbitrage is less important than some of the digital connections. 3D manufacturing is creating different uh, possibilities for manufacturing in local areas. You need rules for data and technology. And importantly, as you know, Hank, you're starting to get a greater regionalization, particularly in East Asia. They're just, you're, you're getting, you know, economic geography or gravity as economists refer to it. it. That's a real thing out there. And the sad thing to say is that the United States has basically taken itself out of the game over the past four years. So we have all our internal debates about this tariff or that tariff or so on and so forth. What we're ignoring is the fact that, you know, the world keeps going and frankly, we're no longer at the table setting the rules going forward. And you've seen this just in the you know, recent weeks with the creation of this new uh, RCEP agreement in Asia, the TPP went forward without the United States. And so you know, one of the questions will be, can the United States get back in the game? And Bob, you know, the politics have never been good for trade, never been easy. We benefit enormously from trade. You know, I look at it, it seems obvious to me, you know, 96% of the population of the world is outside of America and uh, some of the fastest growing markets and trade creates jobs and prosperity, but there are also dislocations. And so it's difficult. Do you think the politics is 
too difficult to get a trade deal done now, or how do we make the case? Well, the irony is, I think there could be an opportunity for the Biden administration to put together a new coalition for trade. You know, if you look at some polls, like from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, you actually see the support for trade among Americans is in the 70s, the 80 percent, you know, even like 59 percent in the most recent poll thought it was good for jobs. But that's kind of an inchoate thing. And those who oppose it, often the unions are the ones that sort of form the key constituencies. I think actually, if you look at Democratic voters now, they're more pro-trade than Republican voters. I think that reflects some reaction to Trump, probably younger voters being more connected with the world. I suspect what you'd need to do is realize you could connect these trade agreements with environmental and carbon issues. You could connect them with some of the health issues, the health supplies, where we've had bans on different things. You need to connect them to the digital area. In the United States, you always need to watch for the agriculture community because of the power that it has in the Senate. And while the NAFTA rewrite, the USMCA, in my view, had some steps back, it was able to bring some union support by bringing in labor, sort of quite detailed labor interventions in the case of Mexico. So if you were creative, you might want to take that idea and say, take the three North Americans and try to do something with Britain after Brexit. You know, you've got to believe that the labor standards in Britain should meet the levels that the U.S. unions would want. And that would be an innovative way of connecting North America with Britain in a North Atlantic way and kind of fashioning new standards. However, what I've described requires somebody playing an entrepreneurial role. And we'll have to see because the tendency among many democratic administrations is, you know, they know trade is good, but it's politically sensitive. So how do they kind of just manage it so that it doesn't cause them a problem? But the Obama administration saw this in the first four years, as you know, they kind of didn't move on anything. Then they finally moved on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. If they'd got it done a year earlier, I think that Paul Ryan, when he was speaker, he would have gotten it through because he passed TPA in 2015. So they just missed it by a year. So what I hope actually all of us can do is encourage them to say, you know, figure out a different way to engage on the trade issues because if the US sort of stands pat or takes a protectionist point of view, the rest of the world would just move on. Yep. So let's go from trade, you've done so many things, to the World Bank. And you know, I'm going to want you to just briefly describe the World Bank, but bringing up the World Bank immediately brings to mind the huge challenges uh, that the developing world in particular is facing coming out of the pandemic. So what is the World Bank and what role should the World Bank play in alleviating these challenges? So when I used to try to explain the World Bank to people, I'd say, you know, the reason it's probably poorly understood is it's called bank. And everybody thinks that banks, at least in the old days, were supposed to be about sort of lending money. And the World Bank has a variety of financial tools for the poorest. It sometimes uses grants or very long-term loans without interest. It's got long-term loans for middle-income countries. It also lends to the private sector. But in a good year, Hank, as you know, it'd probably be maybe 60 to $70 billion of finance a year which is not chicken feed, but in the larger financial markets, it's a drop in the bucket. So what you need to think about with the bank is how it can use its programs to catalyze policy changes. In a sense, the loans need to be seen as pilots or demonstration projects or ways of transferring knowledge and kind of better practices. And the enjoyable thing is these run from everything from safety nets, in to my era, I tried to also focus on the importance of women and girls. If you leave out 50% of your population, what's it going to do? Innovations in open data, infrastructure, anti-corruption, clearly the role of private sector policies. So if you think about that today with COVID-19, it's a good example of people having a better feel for how the international system works. President-elect Biden has talked about rejoining the World Health Organization. Well, I think that's a good thing to do. But the WHO doesn't really have the network to help with vaccines and medicines in developing countries. The World Bank, which works with all the health agencies, actually does. It has resources. And so how do you get these institutions to work more closely together? And of course, as you know, this is true for climate issues, environmental issues, the so-called public goods, which is one of the areas that I stress. 
I guess one other thing though about the World Bank, which I know you and I shared a view on, but many don't, is that there's a view among economists that say, oh, well, since you're lending money, you should only give it to the poorest. What I think this misses is the role that the bank plays in pulling all economies together, middle income, poor countries, sort of more developed countries. You play different roles with a Brazil or Mexico. You're really helping more develop governance and capacity and anti-corruption and some of the environmental issues. And you want the middle income players to feel they have a stake in the system. Because if we're going to deal with issues like pandemics or trade or environment or, you know, overall global growth, how are you going to do so if you don't have those players? So it's a different perspective than a pure economics perspective. But in some ways, it goes back to what we really should be thinking about how the U.S. should use these multilaterals. So that brings me, you mentioned the environment. And this is an area you and I both care about. We did some things together when you were at the World Bank. And I was at Treasury, we did some things focused on climate change. You've been a leader in biodiversity and focusing on the tiger. But I'd like you to talk a little bit about the World Bank, what it's done, what it can be doing in combating climate change. And I'd also like you to talk a little bit about why you chose the tiger. You know, I'd visit you in your office and there'd be a beautiful picture of a tiger. Why did you do that? Okay, so, well, you and I work together on what are called the climate investment funds. And this is a good example of the role of the World Bank. And I think it was your idea, but I was the one who kind of picked up on it internationally, which is, you know, at the end of the day, even after you left, I was able to raise about $9 billion from donor countries. I leveraged it into about 70 or $80 billion. And we did different types of financial projects that would bring developing countries into the process. And I connected this after you had left to, after the Copenhagen meeting sort of collapsed, Mexico was holding the next conference of the parties. And I actually went down to see President Calderon and I said, look, you probably think the UNFCCC is gonna run all this. I said, but if something hits the fan, it's gonna be on your shoulders. And so I gave him the idea of what we called the building blocks. And my point on that is under the Rio Treaty that I was involved with back in 92, The way the climate system works is each country makes political commitments and they keep revising and updating them based on science. And so I said to President Calderon, look, rather than get 190 countries agree to everything, if you can get 150 to agree on soil carbon, which might help African agriculture, but absorb carbon, or another 160 on avoided deforestation, you know, or another 140 on adaptation or technology transfer, you could start to link these building blocks together, even if you don't have everybody. And that's exactly what was done on the way to the Paris Accord. And so, again, if you think about the Biden administration today, you know, it's good to rejoin Paris, but frankly, as you know, there's probably about 10 or 12 major economies that really will drive this. You wanna focus on them. Frankly, it's true with cities as Mayor Bloomberg has as well. But you would be wise to kind of draw in with the development institutions some of these interests that the developing countries have with sort of related sort of building block programs. So again, it's the same idea in the multilateral world. You know, how do you create the right constructive incentives for everybody to sort of have a piece of the action? And then on biodiversity, you know, this probably starts with the simple fact that I've always liked animals, maybe not snakes as much as you, Hank, but kind of other critters. And, you know, in some ways that's rather basic is that I sort of feel, you know, we're put on this earth and we kind of have a stewardship for the natural world. So what I found interesting is, you know, while I wasn't in environmental agencies, when you're at the Treasury or the State Department or the World Bank, you often have more leverage than you would if you were an environmental agency. So way back with Baker, he was a hunter, but I was a conservationist. You know, we were able to ban elephant ivory. I experimented, again, with Baker's help on the debt for nature swaps when we were at the Treasury Department. You know, we got a 50-year moratorium on the Antarctic. Working with Baker, I got the Taiwanese and the Japanese to stop drift net fishing. So what you can really see, you know, is if in your one of the key ministries that isn't normally seen as an environmental ministry, you've got access to prime ministers, presidents, finance ministers, a lot of the people that, that write the checks. And so... I tried to do that when I was at the World Bank. And in the case of tigers, you know, this was a one where one of my colleagues, an Indian gentleman came to me one day and said, you know, there's only about 3,500 tigers left alive in the wild. 
And in our lifetime, they could go extinct. So we organized all the countries that actually had tiger ranges. There were 13 of them. And we tried to sort of bring in the science groups, the conservation groups, but also the finance groups, the law enforcement groups. You know, surprise, surprise, Vladimir Putin and I actually co-chaired a summit to sort of launch this effort. And the numbers have actually gone up, but it gives you a little sense again. I've always tried to urge the environmental community, don't be too purist. I mean, let's get things done here. And if we can bring in more players, and right now the key area will be on wildlife trafficking, I think, you know, in law enforcement. Absolutely. And I want to really hammer home one thing you said. In most countries, the environmental ministries aren't very powerful. And the key, and I found this in China and many parts of the world, is getting much higher up in the government. And when you're looking at climate change and biodiversity, I'm a big believer in getting into the finance ministries because it's an economic area. They've got the money. I even think when we were raising money for those climate funds, you know, when I started off talking with finance ministers, but you're totally right there. Well, yeah. in your work on natural wealth accounting, I mean, I started doing this at the World Bank. You have to understand the externalities of it, but there's a lot on the development side that actually is environmental, but it's also natural wealth. I'll share with you another little story. When I first came here to the World Bank, I invited in about five or six of the major conservation groups. And, you know, they were all worried about looking a little elitist. So they were explaining to me all how their environmental projects help development. And I said, look, I'm really glad to hear this. That's good stuff. I said, but who's speaking up for the animals? And uh, I started to get tears in their eyes that somebody actually cared about the creatures of the world. <laughs> That's exactly, it really, really resonates with me. Now, we're going to get into an area where we could spend an hour and we don't have time to do it. But you are one of the clearest thinkers when it comes to U.S.-China policy. You and I talk about this a lot. What is your diagnosis of the China challenge and what do you think is the best path forward as U.S. policymakers struggle to deal with a rising China? What are we getting wrong? What do we need to do differently, Bob? Well, you know, I think there's been problems on both sides here. And where we are today over the past year and a half in particular is freefall. And I'm not sure where the bottom is and it looks a little dangerous to me. So in the near term, I'd focus on practical kind of off ramps. And one of the fundamental tensions that you see that in a sense, people often haven't fully recognized, you hear a lot about great power competition. And the way geopolitical people think, they often think about great power competition is it's sort of zero sum, one wins, one loses. But if you think about a lot of the topics we've talked about, climate, environment, international economics, technology, those are the transnational issues have some win-win possibilities. So how can, you, how can you, in a sense, deal with some of the political and security tensions, but also find the win-win possibilities? There's no doubt that, I mean, you and I both got to know President Xi. I got to know him, coincidentally, way back when he was a party secretary in, in Hangzhou and then as vice president. His focus on control of the Communist Party and centralizing the system, in my view, is a step back. I like to tell this story that when he became head of China in 2012, he created this documentary film about the end of the Soviet Union and uh, ordered all the party cadres to see it. And if he had that film in Europe, Gorbachev would be the hero that ended the Cold War. Well, the Chinese version is a little different. Gorbachev is the fool that abandoned the Communist Party, broke up his country, led to ruin. And so, you know, he wants to centralize control in the Communist Party, and that's going to make life a little bit more difficult. However, I also believe, and you've been part of this, as have I been, is that there's a view in the United States that, well, cooperation with China failed. And this just isn't true. I mean, there's a long record on economic proliferation, you know, environmental issues. What it does tell you is the work is never done. I mean, surprise, you know, diplomacy is not just something you could put in the back office and file in a cabinet. From the U.S. today, the starting point, of course, is what we do at home you know, not only our science and technology in our society. I personally think it's a mistake to follow China in closing society off. I think our strength is our openness, immigration, ideas, people. So when we imitate sort of China's behavior in what you properly identified as kind of a false reciprocity, I think that's a mistake. You wanna work with your allies and your partners. You know, your recent speech on the targeted reciprocity is one way to frame it. What it basically says is, you know, you need to have fair treatment, but you don't want to just do it in a reflexive way. You want to focus on the results you want to try to have. 
and build a record of common sort of interests. In places, that means, you know, we're going to have differences. We're going to need to have a security policy that deters Chinese military power. On values, you know, my view is on something like Hong Kong, as opposed to just sanctioning people, I would open up the United States for some of the people from Hong Kong to come, like Britain is. That's the best way to show the difference in societies. So it's just going to be a long-term effort, but I think a simple confrontation or stomping our feet or saying you can't work with China because they're evil, that's just not realistic. Bob, you and I sure agree on that one. Now, you know, I don't know when I've enjoyed a book as much as I've enjoyed your new book, America in the World. Now, we're not going to be focusing on it much time today because you and I, I interviewed you on a podcast interview with the Chicago Council, which is available online, and I don't want to retread that ground. But for those that haven't read your book or listened to the interview, give our listeners a quick sense of what the book is about and why you wrote it, because it's a fascinating book. Well, just as this conversation is revealed, Hank, I always thought about history as I was trying to deal with policy problems. And I could give a lot of examples from German unification and NAFTA to the changing world bank role. But so one of the things I wanted to do, particularly for younger generation, was to write something that talked about foreign policy that urged them to think about how they would think about Americans' traditions and experience. And so I actually start with Ben Franklin in, in our revolution. And I wrote it in a way to appeal to more general audience. So I, in some ways, it's a multiple biography. Each chapter is on a person or two. I try to dig into a particular problem. And I try to emphasize the pragmatic problem solving. And in the process, share my assessments and some of the ideas. One of the things that's actually encouraged me, Hank, is as some friends have used it with students in universities, they kind of like the idea that actually something can work. They've had a lot of critical studies professors that tell them how everything is in terrible shape and maybe they're right, but this is a book that also says you can get some things done. So that's the purpose of the book. And I'll tell you what I like about it is you can read it in so many discrete parts. It's a series of stories and it's a series of fascinating stories about historical figures some we know very well, like, you know, Ben Franklin and Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt and FDR, and some many of us have never heard of, but are fascinating. So I think you really made history come alive in that book, Bob. Now, okay. let's just say, if you were President Biden's Treasury Secretary, what would be your primary focus today? Well, I'll go back to a piece of advice that Baker gave to President-elect Reagan in 1981. He said, you know, Mr. President, you have three priorities, economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic recovery. So now it's a combination of pandemic and economic recovery. Frankly, you know, what happens to the presidency in the United States over the next least year, 18 months, has got to focus on that issue. And there are both domestic and international parts of that for the Treasury rule. I subscribe to this view that the type of recovery that we have is the K-shaped recovery. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you're active in the digital world, if you're a holder of equities, you know, you're on the top leg of the K and this is unpleasant, but you know, you, you, can, you can manage it. If however, you're disconnected from the digital world, if you're a small and medium-sized enterprise that doesn't have that links, you know, if you're women in the retail sector, you're really struggling. So I'd be focusing on an inclusive recovery that tries to help kind of that bottom group sort of be part of it as a whole. And then internationally, I mean, you know this, some treasury secretaries are a little slow to pick this up. The US leadership and leverage is absolutely critical. So I use the example of the WHO with the World Bank and International Financial Institutions. Frankly, the US treasury could help make that happen. And frankly, you could draw in the World Trade Organization so they, they don't, people have export bans on health goods. As you know, the developing countries have gotten hit pretty hard with this. You've got some bad debt problems. Some of that's China related. At the same time, the U.S. has been a little sluggish on what the IMF can do, maybe with the use of these special drawing rights. In my mind, probably the way you think too, there's a deal there <laughs> where you actually could solve something with China and also help the developing worlds. And frankly, I would try to have the Treasury Secretary kind of help the trade community as well. So going back to the book, you know, my first chapter after Ben Franklin is on Alexander Hamilton. And that wasn't accidental. I didn't pick a secretary of state. I picked the secretary of the treasury because 
the Treasury Secretary can be very influential on these issues. For sure. Now, Bob, you know, a few years ago, you ran a marathon in two hours and 32 minutes. Now, I struggled to run a mile at that pace. So that says a lot about your discipline and your athleticism. So are you still running regularly? And uh, talk a little bit about that and, and what other things you do to relax today. Well, actually, it was 232.28, I have to be fair. <laughs> I think it was about 547 a mile, and I couldn't run one mile in 547 either. I suppose the real reason I was a marathoner, Hank, was I wasn't fast enough at the other distances, but I did have endurance. Sad to say, after about 49 years of running, I had some spinal problems. So I had some surgery. But once you've got exercise in your blood, you know, you miss it terribly. So I substitute, I, I use an elliptical, I use an exercise bike. And I do fast walks because I'm not supposed to run, but sometimes I slip into a slow jog. At least my wife accuses me of that. And then not surprisingly, given what we've talked about, when I have time to enjoy myself, I try to read history and biography. Yeah, I bet. I bet. So finally, what advice do you have for younger listeners who are looking to begin their career right in the midst of this pandemic? Well, we've already talked about it a little bit. Pick your boss, you know, yeah. kind of put yourself in, in your boss's shoes. You know, again, it sounds old fashioned, but always look for opportunities to learn. And along the way, as I describe my career, at different stops. And I, I always put a premium on performance because you never knew, you know, what somebody would see. You did some small project somewhere and they think, yeah, that person is sort of really good. So, you know, I, I emphasize that. And then I think there's another part which relates to what I'll call kind of the discipline and focus. And I even saw this with my colleagues when I was at USGR, State Department, the World Bank. I kind of modified something that General Marshall supposedly did, which is, you know, sometimes when people come in your office and they're frustrated and they're screwing a lot about various problems, and I would wait for them to finish, and then I would stop and pause and say, okay, what is the question you would like me to answer? And what do you recommend? <laughs> and so after you get through all the, the feelings, you kind of say, what's the real issue here we have to decide? And kind of what are you thinking on it? And I did that as a technique to kind of sharpen people's sense of, you know, it's not enough to kvetch about something. You have to figure out what's the next step and how are you going to try to do it? And then I suppose in a way, as we've also talked about a lot of these issues, a lot of it is also being able to connect dots. So I was fortunate in my career, and you had this as you know, investment banking and other aspects. You have to kind of see different dimensions of the problem. And I personally find, even now when I've been talking to people with the incoming administration about some of these issues we've talked about, is that I'm trying to say, look, you know, how do you connect the international financial institutions with your strategy, relationship with Europe, the pandemic, you're strengthening your alliance. You kind of try to have results that sort of demonstrate that you're moving forward on the agenda, but you still need some framework in which to operate. Yeah, and Bob, I could tell in everything I've done when I have the first sessions with young people, I could tell right away those that were going to be really successful because the most successful ones put themselves in my shoes. And so they, if I asked them a narrow question, they often came back and answered the question, but then asked themselves, why is he asking me this? And then answered things that I hadn't asked. And I call that defining the job expansively. And some people naturally do that. Some have to work harder to do that. But th that's exactly that. Well, and, and, and the other point, and not just to flatter you, but to be honest, I think, you know, one of your strengths has been the way you will draw from different people and synthesize. And this goes ultimately to the confidence about having other good people around and realize, you know, you've got some skill sets as I do, and there's others we're not as strong at. How do you find other people? And then the real skill becomes in kind of pulling them together effectively and drawing out the best of a group. For sure. So Bob, thank you for shedding light on some of the most important issues our nation is facing today. It's been very, very helpful. Thank you. My pleasure. Good to be with you back in Illinois. Good. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. 
To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.